Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the plenary session. CDAR Distinguished Lecture, Modeling, Specifying, and Forecasting of Space Weather, which will be given by Professor Bashan. It will be introduced by Professor Rob Hillis. Um, the Distinguished <laughs> CDAR Lecture was instituted in 2009 to recognize individuals within the CEDAR community that have made sustained contributions to this uh, within CEDAR. The Distinguished Award refers to a long-term sustainable work over a period greater than 10 years that has helped shape the CEDAR program through research and service. The recipient of the award presented an invited plenary lecture at the CEDAR workshop in June, which is happening today. I think I may have, I'm sorry, I may have a couple of uh, technical problems. So my announcements at the beginning might not have been heard about the Zoom links and also that we'll be using a Slido to ask questions. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So with that, I will let Professor Rob Hillis introduce Professor Balshan. Rob. Thanks, Ilya. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really a, a great pleasure for me to introduce this year's uh, distinguished, uh, CEDAR Distinguished Lecturer. Bob Schunk has been at the forefront of ionospheric modeling for, well, let's just, just say a long time. Um, he's well known for uh, thorough treatments of important problems and, and for his candor in evaluating and interpreting the results. His book, uh, Ionospheres, is a rather complete reference uh, that many of us uh, in, the, in this meeting, I think, will have consulted just to retrieve the principles governing the behavior of planetary ionospheres. But uh, quite apart from uh, providing this invaluable reference, Bob has also directed our attention to a number of fundamental ionospheric phenomena that are the foundations of our research today. His work on modeling the response of high latitude ionosphere to convection, for example, revealed features such as the tongue of ionization, the uh, mid-latitude trough uh, that we're still working on today. That same model showed the impact of ionospheric flows on frictional heating and ionospheric chemistry that are incorporated in models. And during that same time, Bob pointed out that the temperature in the high latitude ionosphere is critically dependent on the magnetospheric heat flux. This is a parameter that we're still trying to measure and calculate today. He was among the first to investigate the effects of photoelectron heating and temperature anisotropies on the outflows of H plus and O plus at high latitudes into the outer plasmasphere. And that work is now incorporated into models of ionosphere magnetosphere coupling. But during his work, Bob's always had been a critical evaluator of his work. He was the first to acknowledge the limitations of models that were poorly constrained by the lack of observations. And it was this appreciation of these limitations, I think, that led him to embark on the first data assimilation approaches to specifying the global ionosphere. Many of you may have heard of the, the game model that led the way to many more assimilation models that are being developed today. My objective here is not to make a full long list of Bob's accomplishments, but rather just to demonstrate that the breadth of work that includes the important problems that he's worked on, the results of which have a sustained impact on our field. And what this means is that Bob is someone who's worth listening to. You can learn a lot just by extracting a little from what he has to say. And it's for these reasons that I'm really grateful to be here and for the opportunity to introduce this year's CEDAR Distinguished Lecturer, Professor Bob Schunk. So Bob. I am pleased and honored to present the 2020 CEDAR Distinguished Lecture. Clearly, I'm going to be talking about modeling, specifying, and forecasting space weather, but this is a very broad topic, and hence I will mainly discuss the work that I have been involved in during my 50-year career.
Korea. In addition, the emphasis of my talk will be on the ionosphere thermosphere system. The attached is the outline of what I'm going to cover. First, I'll talk about what is space weather. Then I'll present some physics-based ionosphere and thermosphere models. This is followed by upper atmosphere ionosphere weather models. After that, I'll discuss multi-model ensemble prediction system. And then finally, I'll discuss averaging of data simulation models. Now, I'm only going to give the big picture, an overview of what we have accomplished um, during my 50-year career. And after that, what I'll do is I'll provide backup slides with some specific references that will be very helpful. The first topic is space weather. What are the causes of space weather? Well, one of the main causes of space weather is solar weather. There are changes in the solar wind, there are solar flares, and there are coronal mass ejections. And in addition, you have plasma instabilities in the ionosphere and waves propagating up from the lower atmosphere. Sunspots are dark regions on the sun. They are located in the sun's lower atmosphere and are a result of stormy localized magnetic fields. The stormy magnetic fields choke the flow of energy from below, and hence sunspots are cooler than the surrounding area. Cooler regions emit less electromagnetic radiation and therefore are dark. Sunspots exhibit an 11-year solar cycle. High sunspot numbers mean the sun is very active, and this leads to intense space weather. From about 1645 to 1715, there was very little solar activity, and this period is known as the Maunda Minimum. This period coincides with a very cold period on Earth known as the Little Ice Age. However, it is not clear if the low solar activity was the cause of the Little Ice Age. A solar flare is a sudden explosion of intense electromagnetic radiation from the sun's surface. Solar flares can produce enhanced densities in the ionospheric T region. They can also interfere with radio frequency communications and power line transmissions on Earth. Here's an example of a coronal mass ejection. It's a major explosion in the upper atmosphere of the sun. And as you can see, during a coronal mass ejection, speeds can approach 2 million miles per hour. The mass can be 220 billion pounds, but the explosion power, if you like, is equivalent to 1 billion hydrogen bombs. So when a coronal mass ejection is pointed at the Earth and it hits the Earth, it'll have a major effect on ionosphere-thermosphere weather. I hope all of you recognize this planet, but we want to go over some numbers in connection with going from the Sun to the Earth. Earth is located at 150 million kilometers from the Sun. Light takes about 500 seconds to reach Earth from the Sun. The solar wind takes two to three days to reach Earth. And at Earth, the solar wind speed varies from approximately 200 to 900 kilometers per second, depending on conditions. The density of the solar wind at Earth varies from approximately 1 to 80 per cubic centimeter, and the temperature of the solar wind at Earth is 100,000 Kelvin in general. Here is an example of the effect that the sun's weather has on the ionosphere. The left diagram shows an auroral display as photographed from the ground. The right diagram is a snapshot of the auroral oval. The important thing to notice is this structure. There's a lot of intensity in this region here, but then there's none here. So this structure and the intensity difference is very important in describing space weather and ionosphere weather. Now, in addition to the structure and the precipitation, the convection electric fields, the horizontal and field line currents, they will also be significantly affected and have structure in them. Likewise, the ionosphere-thermosphere system itself 
will be structured because of these variations in structure in the precipitation. And that's what we want to model, and that's what we like to specify. Here is a snapshot of the auroral oval during a one hour period. So these snapshots are roughly 10 to 12 minutes apart. To note that even in a 10 or 12 minute period, look at how the precipitation changes, the structure that occurs. And here there's very little precipitation except in one domain. Likewise, I indicated before, when you have this kind of structure in the precipitation, you're gonna have the same structure in the convection electric fields, horizontal and field line currents, and in the ionosphere thermosphere system. And that is gonna be difficult to model. But nonetheless, because of all the structure, you're gonna get a number of ionosphere thermosphere features. Some of these include traveling convection vortices, sun aligned and auroral locks, propagating plasma patches and atmospheric holes, supersonic neutral winds, storm enhanced densities, and spread off, spread F and equatorial plasma bubbles. As I noted in the previous slide, there are a wide range of weather features. I would now like to show some examples. I will show three weather features at high latitudes, one at middle latitudes, and one at low latitudes. The first one at high latitudes is the tongue of ionization. The tongue of ionization forms in a winter polar region when the interplanetary magnetic field turns southward. It forms in sunlight near the cusp. Anti-sunward plasma convection extends the high-density plasma across the dark polar cap, forming the tongue. The density of the tongue can be more than a factor two higher than the background plasma density. The second example of a space weather feature is propagating plasma patches. Like the tongue of ionization, the propagating plasma patches appear in a winter polar region when the interplanetary magnetic field turns southward. They form in sunlight, equatorward of the dayside auroral oval. Patches can be either circular or cigar-shaped. The patch density can be up to a factor of 100 above background plasma densities. The patches drift in an anti-sunward direction with the background plasma. The figure on the left shows cigar-shaped plasma patches drifting in an anti-sunward direction across Greenland. The dimensions of these cigar shaped plasma patches are 200 by 1,000 kilometers. The velocity of these patches is about 730 meters per second. This figure shows the third example of space weather at high latitudes. Shown are plasma drift velocities in the high latitude F region and a magnetic latitude, magnetic local time reference frame. The data were obtained with the ion drift meter on the Dynamics Explorer 2 satellite. The convection pattern appears to be turbulent. The ion drift velocities were measured during a crossing of the northern polar region when the IMF was northward. The traversal of the polar region took only 12 minutes, and therefore the highly structured drift velocities probably represent spatial structure in the convection pattern and not time variations. A careful examination of the figure indicates that there were nine reversals of the flow direction. Therefore, this case corresponds to extreme space weather. This slide shows a comparison of weather features in the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. Here, you have a snowstorm to the east of Utah, and we have another storm to the east of the United States. That's in the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. In the ionosphere and upper atmosphere, you have what's known as a storm enhanced density. It's a ridge of high plasma density, and the density in the plasma ridge could be a factor two or more compared to the background plasma density. And this feature extends from below Florida up to Canada. And that's a nice comparison to show that you get storm features in the lower atmosphere and indeed in the ionosphere. Plasma instabilities in the F region can lead to spread F irregularities. In the equatorial region, spread F can lead to plasma bubbles at night. 
Plasma bubbles are vertically elongated wedges of depleted plasma that drift upward from beneath the bottom side F layer to altitudes as high as 1,500 kilometers. A depleted wedge extends north-south along the B field, and it also extends east-west by up to several thousand kilometers. Basically, the bubble wedges look like upside-down watermelon slices. The east-west distance between separate bubble wedges ranges from tens to hundreds of kilometers. When bubbles form, their upward speed generally varies from 100 to 500 meters per second. However, fast bubbles can drift upward with a speed as high as 5 kilometers per second. The plasma density in the bubble can be up to two orders of magnitude lower than that in the surrounding medium. The next topic to be discussed is physics-based ionosphere and thermosphere models. During my 50-year academic career, I've been involved in the development of five global physics-based models of the ionosphere and thermosphere. The first model that we developed was the time-dependent ionosphere model, the TDIM. It's a global physics-based ionosphere model coupled to a global empirical thermosphere model, the EMSIS atmospheric model. At high latitudes, you have to specify the convection electric field and auroral precipitation patterns as a function of time. At equatorial latitudes, you have to specify the equatorial electric field. The second model I was involved in the development of is the ionospheric forecast model. Basically, the IFM is the same as the TDIM, but has been modified to run faster than real time. This is because it was the first operational model that we developed, and it had to run faster than real time. The third model that I was involved in the development of is the ionosphere plasmosphere model, the IPM. It's a global physics-based ionosphere plasmosphere model coupled to a global empirical thermosphere model. The fourth model, IPM Global. This is a global physics-based ionosphere plasmosphere model extended to include high latitudes. The ionosphere at high latitudes is similar to the TDIM, but it includes a polar wind outflow at the upper boundary. The fifth model, the global thermosphere model, this is a physics-based model coupled to either an empirical ionosphere, a physics-based ionosphere, or a data simulation ionosphere model. In what follows, I'm going to take three of the models and go into a little bit more detail so you can see what the features are in the three models. The ionosphere plasmosphere model, the IPM, has the following characteristics. The altitude range is from 90 to 30,000 kilometers. The altitude, latitude, and longitude grids can be set by the user. Six ion species are included, NO+, O2+, N2+, O+, H+, and HE+. A realistic magnetic field is used, the IGRF, the International Geomagnetic Reference Field. Some of the physical processes included in the IPM are field-aligned diffusion, cross-field electrodynamic drifts, thermospheric winds, neutral composition changes, energy-dependent chemical reactions, and ion production due to solar UV and EUV radiation, auroral precipitation, and starlight. Actually, the production due to starlight is important in the E region at night. Another model that is important for both our research efforts and our data simulation efforts is IPM Global. This model is composed of an ionosphere plasmosphere model, the IPM, that covers low and mid latitudes, and an ionosphere polar wind model that covers high latitudes. The altitude range at mid low latitudes is from 90 to 30,000 kilometers. At high latitudes, the altitude range is from 90 to 10,000 kilometers. As with the IPM, the altitude, latitude, and longitude grids can be set by the user. The model produces a fully global distribution. It contains the same six ions that was, were contained in the IPM. It also outputs 3D time-dependent distributions for the electron ion temperatures, and it outputs the drifts, plasma drifts 
both along and perpendicular to the geomagnetic field. Now, what is important is, as the high latitude region expands and contracts due to geomagnetic storms, the B field lines open and close accordingly. So it's all self consistent with regard to expansion and contraction of the ionosphere, plasma sphere, polar wind system. Another model that is very important for our research and data simulation efforts is the global thermosphere model, GTM ionosphere. The altitude ranges from 40 to 800 kilometers. The altitude, latitude, and longitude grids can be set by the user. The neutrals that are produced, global distributions of the neutrals, N2, O2, and O. non hydrostatic and nonlinear flows can be described. We can describe with the model planetary, tidal, gravity, and sound waves. The model properly takes account of subsonic, transonic, and supersonic winds. It can also take account of wave breaking in the lower thermosphere. And an important issue, and I mentioned it earlier, is this global thermosphere model can be coupled to a global empirical physics-based or data assimilation ionosphere. Now, we, in one of the examples that we ran a, a period, we had a, the GTM ionosphere simulation. It included an equator with propagating traveling atmospheric disturbance interacting with an upward propagating gravity wave from the lower atmosphere. And the interactions are described in, can be seen in this figure. The next topic to be covered is up atmosphere ionosphere weather models. I should point out this is the global assimilation of ionospheric measurements I'm talking about, Kane. I should point out there were seven core members for most of the game work, but now we're just down to three members. I should point out that Lutke Shearless, he's the common filter expert. He's the lead programmer for game. He works on data assimilation problems and anything connected with quality issues. His effort is very, very, very significant and it is a continuing effort. It never stops. Larry Gardner, his work involves acquiring the data and checking data quality, improving and expanding the physics-based models, helping look to, with data assimilation, and maintaining our computer system. And their part is definitely critical to the success of the program and into to the future. This slide shows the seven core game members. Starting on the left, we have Lee Ju, Jan Soika, Lutke Shearless, Don Thompson, myself, and then on the upper right, Vince Eccles, and on the lower right, Larry Gardner. Now, it should be noted that all seven members were lead authors on important game papers. The backup slides provide papers published by the seven core members and that'll show which ones are important and which one they provided the main information for. Here are the three main USU game models. The Gauss-Markov model was an operational Air Force model from 2006 to 2020. The full physics model became an operational Air Force model in 2020. The third model is the Ensemble Common Filter for High Latitude Ionosphere Dynamics and Electrodynamics. That model is currently just a science model, it's not an operational model. In what follows, I will give a, an overview of the Game Gauss Markov and Game Full Physics models. Over the years, we have conducted many data assimilation runs, and now both the Game GM and Game Full Physics models can assimilate multiple data types. The data are assimilated exactly as they are measured. We have assimilated bottom side electron density profiles from Digisons, approximately 200. We've assimilated slant TEC from more than a thousand ground-based GPS receivers. We've assimilated electron densities along satellite tracks, in particular to four DMSB satellites. We've assimilated 
integrated UV emissions from four instruments, LORAS, SULI, SUSI, and TIP. We have also assimilated occultation data from five satellites, CHAMP, IOX, SACSI, COSMIC, and CNAPS. And again, I want to remind you that the data assimilated were at low and middle latitudes. This slide provides a brief description of the GAME GM model. The ionospheric forecast model is the global physics-based model for the background ionosphere. This model covers 90 to 1400 kilometers in altitude. The data simulation cadence is 15 minutes. The model covers the E region, NO+, N2+, O2+, and the F layer and top side, O+, and H+, and the electron ion temperatures. However, only the electron density is used by the GM model. The common filter solves for deviations from the background electron density. GAME-GM does not provide information about ionospheric drivers. By that I mean the electric fields, neutral winds, etc. In 2009, we created the USU Space Weather Center, and we started to run the game GM model 24 hours a day, seven days a week to provide continuous specifications of the ionosphere. This figure is a snapshot of a global run. 357 global TEC stations were used in the real time run at the Space Weather Center. Approximately 10,000 slant TEC measurements were assimilated every 15 minutes. The left panel shows the vertical TEC specification, and the right panel shows the corresponding data. Note that for the right panel, the slant TE data were converted to the vertical TEC so that there can be a one-to-one -one comparison between the left and right panels. Also note that red corresponds to high TEC and blue to low TEC. In addition to the global game GM run, we also ran a high resolution regional game GM run in real time. For this regional game GM run, about 10,000 slant TEC measurements were assimilated every 15 minutes. The left panel shows a snapshot of the vertical TEC specification, and the right panel shows the corresponding data. As in the previous figure, red is for high TEC and blue is for low TEC. This slide provides a brief description of gameful physics. It is an ensemble common filter. The background physics-based model is the ionosphere plasmasphere model. At every time step, 24 to 30 IPM simulations are launched, each one with different drivers, different electric field, neutral wind, and neutral composition patterns. The assimilated data determine which of the 24 to 30 IPM runs is the best. And this process is repeated at every time step until the data, model, and drivers are in agreement. Gameful physics can assimilate five different data sources as shown in a previous slide. The altitude, latitude, and longitude grids can be set by the user. The output of the game for physics is ionospheric specifications, forecasts, and drivers. After the game for physics model was ready for continuous real-time runs, it was installed at the USU Space Weather Center. This figure shows a snapshot of a game for physics global run. Approximately 10,000 slant TEC measurements were assimilated every 15 minutes. In addition, bottom side electron density profiles were also assimilated from 40 to 50 ionoson slash digison stations. The left panel shows a snapshot of the game for physics specification, in this case, vertical TEC, and the right panel shows the corresponding data. The game for physics model can also be run in a regional mode. Shown here is a snapshot of a gameful physics reconstruction for the U.S. 
at 17 UT, day 82, 2004. The left panel shows the game for physics measurements, vertical TEC. The middle panel shows the TEC reconstructing, vertical TEC. And the right panel shows the deduced meridional neutral wind at 300 kilometers in meters per second. We are proud of the fact that the game data simulation models have been or are currently running at the Air Force Weather Agency, now called 557 Weather Wing, Northward Grumman, the Air Force Research Laboratory, the Naval Research Laboratory, the USU Space Weather Center, and the Community Coordinated Modeling Center. Scientists at JPL and USC have been working on data assimilation as long as we have. At some point, we decided to work together and we created the Multi-Model Ensemble Prediction System MEPS so that we can conduct ensemble modeling with data assimilation models. The current MEPS team members from JPL are Xiaoxing Fei, Tony Minushi, and Attila Kanjafi. The scientists from the University of Southern California are Chengming Wang and Gary Rosen. This slide shows the MEPS data assimilation models at our disposal. We had Game BL, Band Limited, Mid and Low Latitudes, Game GM, Gauss Markov, Mid and Low Latitudes, Game 40 VAR, Mid and Low Latitudes with drivers, Game Full Physics, Mid and Low Latitudes with drivers. We have the Mid Low Electro Data Assimilation Model, it's the ionosphere with drivers, the ID EDDA, it's high latitude with drivers. Global Thermosphere Model, DA, it's for the Global Thermosphere, and a new model, TWAM, Thermospheric Wind Assimilation Model. These models display global, regional, and nested grid capabilities that can be used for science, specifications, and forecasts. Further details about them can be obtained from the references given as backup slides. Meteorologists have shown that the best models for specifications and forecasts are physics-based data assimilation models. They have also shown that multi-model ensemble forecasts are very useful. The figure shows a multi-model ensemble forecast for Hurricane Rita. At the beginning of the MEPS program, we listed some initial tasks that we wanted to pursue. The first step is to select a storm period that we could model. Next, we wanted to select the MEPS models and data. After that, we want to conduct MEPS ensemble model runs. With the model runs, we wanted to then study the effect of different data types on the model runs. After that, we wanted to compare MEPS reconstructions. Finally, we wanted to study the usefulness of ensemble averaging in the ionosphere. The storm period selected for our study was 16 to 17 March 2013. The first day was quiet with a KP of about 1 to 2. The second day was a storm day with a KP of about 6. The models selected for this study are the four game models. All of them cover mid and low latitudes. We have the game band limited, the game Gauss Markov, the game 4D VAR, and the game full physics. Two of them calculate self consistent drivers. The data that we're going to use in this study um, include ground based GPS TEC, satellite to satellite occultation data, which yields the electron density at 800 kilometers, bottom side electron density profiles using ionosons and digisons, and UV emissions, both 9-11 angstrom and 13-56 angstrom, and it emissions come from both the limb and disc. This figure shows the global data distribution. The white dots show the locations of 530 ground GPS receivers. The black dots show the locations of 80 ionosons and digisons. The purple dots show the cosmic-derived electron densities at 800 kilometers. 
and the background is the game GM reconstruction for the quiet day at 21 UT. The goal here is to study the effect of different data types on the game models. So first we run all four game models with TEC data from 530 ground GPS receivers. After that we run all four game models again with data from 530 ground GPS receivers and cosmic occultation data. Then we do another run of all four game models with 530 ground GPS receiver data, occultation data, and data from 80 digisomes. The goal is to see the difference in the model results and to see how the different models handle the same data type. This is the first step. We want to run the four data simulation models with just TEC data from 500 ground GPS stations. Here is the NMF2 comparison for the storm day at 2100 UT. Red corresponds to high NMF2 values and blue to low. If you look at the left column, you have game 4D var at the top left, and beneath it you have the game pan limited. For the middle column, you have the game full physics. Below that, you have the game Gauss Markov. On the bottom at the right is the ionosphere plasma sphere model, which is the physics based model behind the game full physics. Now, clearly, at looking at these results, there are similarities, but there are also important differences. Differences in magnitude of the equatorial anomaly are clearly evident. Some differences in longitude and the width of the equatorial anomaly are evident. The four models show enhanced NMF2 in the southern hemisphere beyond 30 degrees latitude. And again, I injured, indicated that we only present the IFM to give you an idea of what a physics-based model would look like. This slide shows the HMF2 comparison for the storm day at 2100 UT. Again, red corresponds to high HMF2 values and blue to low HMF2 values. The format of the figure is the same. In the upper left, you got the game 4D var. Below that, you got the game band limited. In the middle column, you got game full physics at the top and game Gauss Markov under it. And then the IPM predict, uh, prediction is given in the lower right. Again, there are many similarities, but there are also a couple of important differences. The equatorial region at zero degrees and at 120 degrees longitude has significant differences. And at middle latitudes in the southern hemisphere, hemisphere there are significant differences. Now we want to run the four data simulation models with TEC data from 530 ground GPS receivers and satellite to satellite occultation data which corresponds to the electron density at 800 kilometers. This slide shows a comparison of the four game reconstructions. This is a case where GPS and occultation data were assimilated. As with the previous slides, the results are shown versus geographic latitude and longitude. Red corresponds to high parameter values and blue to low values. There are three columns. These columns correspond to TEC, NMF2, and HMF2. The rows correspond to game Gauss Markov, game full physics, game 4D VAR, and game band limited. Including the densities at 800 kilometers help to improve the reconstructions over the oceans. However, the differences noted for the GPS TEC, TEC data case alone are still relevant. As it turns out, two of the four game models were not able to assimilate the Ionason Digison data. Therefore, I will only show the effect of the three data types on the game for physics model. This slide shows the results for the game for physics model at 21 UT on the storm day. The top row corresponds to GPS data only being assimilated. The middle row shows GPS and occultation data assimilation. 
and the bottom row shows TPS, occultation, and SEO data assimilation. The first column shows vertical TEC. The middle column shows NMF2, the peak electron density. And the right column shows HMF2, the peak height of the F layer. Red corresponds to high values, and blue corresponds to low values. A careful examination indicates that there is a difference, and we will look at that in a little bit more detail. This slide provides a more quantitative view of the effect of the different data types on reconstruction. The format of the slide is similar to the previous slide. In fact, the top row is identical to the previous slide. The top row shows vertical TEC, NMF2, and HMF2. This row corresponds to the gameful physics reconstruction with GPS TEC data only. The middle row shows the change due to adding occultation data. The bottom row shows the change due to adding occultation and digison data. Note that additional data affects the reconstruction of places away from the data locations. The data simulation reconstructions are very similar, but there are important differences. The fact that the reconstructions are not exactly the same is not surprising because the data assimilation models are based on different background physics-based models, different assimilation techniques, different spatial and temporal resolutions, different deduced electrodynamics drifts, different deduced neutral winds and O to N2 ratios. Eventually, our goal is, to, is a systematic study to elucidate causes of the differences. The question is, Will you get a better specification if you average the output obtained from the separate data simulation models? Larry Gardner is the lead team member pursuing this issue. The period we're covering is March 12 to 19, 2013. It's the same storm period that we were considering in previous slides. Now I should point out in general, an ensemble of models can consist of empirical, physics based and data simulation models. For this study, we're going to pick five data simulation models and one physics based model. Of course, it covers mid and low latitudes like in the previous slides. We're going to cover GPS and occultation data only. I should point out for this period, it's solar minimum, equinox, and as I said above, the storm period that we've been looking at all along is contained in this period. We're going to show results for a simple average of the models. In this case, you sum the models and divide by the number of models. And then we're going to look at a weighted average of the models. You sum the models weighted by the fit to the GPS data and then divided by the number of models. The models selected for this study are the four game models that we've been using all along and a new mid-low latitude electrodynamic data assimilation model. This model also provides drivers, and it is based on the physics-based ionospheric forecast model. And the sixth model is the ionospheric forecast model. And there'll be no data assimilation here, of course. It's just a physics-based model. For the simple average, the output from each of the six models was first put on a consistent grid. Then, at each grid point, the vertical TEC values were added and then divided by 6. This case included GPS TEC data and the occultation data, and by that I mean the densities at 800 kilometers. The figure is a snapshot at 2100 UT on the storm day. The figure shows the ensemble mean of the vertical TEC in the top right panel. The vertical TEC measurements in the bottom right panel, and the comparison of the data and the ensemble mean in the left panel. For perfect agreement, all of the ensemble mean TEC values would agree with the measurements, and that would fall on the 45 degree line. However, the ensemble mean shows well-defined equatorial ionization anomalies, and they are in good agreement with the measurements. The main conclusion of this study is that the ensemble mean at all times throughout the seven-day period 
was better than the individual data assimilation models. This figure shows the results for NMF2. As in the previous slide, the ensemble mean is shown in the top right panel. The NMF2 measurements from selected ionosons is shown in the bottom right panel, and the comparison of the ensemble mean and the data is shown in the left panel. The results are not as good as for the vertical TEC comparison between the ensemble mean and data. However, even for NMF2, a simple average of the six data assimilation models was better than any of the individual data assimilation models. This slide shows the results for HMF2. The layout of the figure is the same as in the two previous figures. With just GPS, TEC, and topside density data, all of the models had difficulty in capturing HMF2 because a given NMF2 could occur at different heights. Therefore, a simple average of the six models did not produce an improved result for HMF2. We also considered a case where a weighted average of the six ensemble members was used instead of a simple average. How Larry Gardner set up the weighted average is described in the Space Weather 2021 publication given in the reference list. For this specific case, the weighted average was slightly better than the simple average. However, a lot of additional work needs to be done before general conclusions can be drawn about how useful this technique is. Forecasting is very important and we have to discuss that issue. We provide a 24-hour ionospheric forecast with our game operational models based on persistence of the IT drivers. So what do we mean by that? Well, persistence means you take the drivers from 24 hours ago and you use that to drive the IT model in the future. Now, I should point out that this persistence can be launched at any time. In other words, you can provide your forecast at whatever time you want. We also tried something else that is slightly different than persistence. We took the drivers from 24 hours ago and from 48 hours ago. We averaged them and used them in our forecast, our 24-hour forecast, and this seemed to work better. Now, in general, this forecast is more reliable during slowly varying magnetic activity. However, the forecast is reasonable at middle latitudes, somewhat reasonable at low latitudes, and totally unreasonable at high latitudes if magnetic activity changes appropriately in the future. And by appropriately, I mean significantly. Um, a reliable 24-hour forecast for the ionosphere thermosphere system requires reasonable forecasts for the IT drivers. And what do we mean by IT drivers? You have to have the convection electric fields, raw precipitation, field aligned and horizontal currents forecasted at high latitudes. The equatorial electric fields have to be forecasted properly at low latitudes. And upward propagating waves from the lower atmosphere have to be forecasted as well into the future. This is a very, very, very significant challenge for the next decade. And I don't know if we'll be able to, be able to achieve that. This is a summary of the MEPS system and how it can be used. Basically, MEPS is ensemble modeling with different data assimilation models. The data that's assimilated can be on multiple spatial and temporal scales in the different models. There's a wide range of ground and space-based data that's already been used, and it could be expanded upon in the future. This MEPS system can be an important tool for studying basic physics to find out what's happening if there's a new unknown phenomenon up here. You can combine different data sets into a, a coherent picture. So if you're an experimentalist and you have different measurements and you want to have a look at what's going on in, over a certain domain or over the globe, you can combine the different data sets into a coherent picture. You can also fill in regions where there are no data, and that's important. 
This really is a new approach for specifying and forecasting space weather, and I think it'll be valuable in the future when people start using it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. That was a really nice uh, talk. Uh, can we bring up the questions from Slido, please? So we have some questions from Slido. So first question from, <laughs> what would you say is the best parameter to include in a simulation that would improve a specification of forecast? Bob? You're muted, Bob. Bob, if you hit the microphone button in Zoom, lower left, you should be able to unmute yourself. Bob, can you hear us? Bob, we can't hear you. You might have to hit the up or down arrow next to your microphone and pick a different source for your microphone. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can hear you now, Bob. And we can okay. see you, we can hear you. Great, thank you. I should point out that prior, that prior to this um, Zoom, Zoom, I've only been on Zoom twice and both times I had trouble. <laughs> no problem. And even, this is why I had a pre recorded presentation. So, Bob, we can hear you fine. So, why don't you take the first question there? Okay. So, let me, let me read the question again for you. Uh, what would you say is the best additional parameter to include in a simulation that would improve a specification on forecast? HMF2 would be invaluable. That would be very invaluable. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Julie Moses. Uh, I think it would be useful to have a slide uh, of the years of investment uh, in gain as an example of what it takes to produce operational space weather models. This is a great idea for a paper in space weather that would be very helpful to people uh, program offices um, involving budget and planning. I think that was more of a comment, I guess. Yeah, we, um, we've been involved for more than 20 years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, so there is a question from Dolores Nip. Are you able to compare with models um, outside of the MEPS family? Yes. That's very easy to do. And in okay. fact, the CCMC is doing some of that. Okay, that's great to that's great to know, Bob. We have a lot of questions for you. There's another question uh, from Su Wei Fan. Uh, when when different DA systems are carried out, the different ionosphere is produced. What are your validation metrics to evaluate which one is better? Do the results get better with more data? The results definitely get better with more data. And typically we have independent data to verify which is the best. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, we have one question. Um, 
What is the difference between bubbles and irregularities in the equatorial ionosphere? Okay. Um, irregularities could just be, you know, like turbulence. Mm -hmm. Like turbulence. And then the bubbles is just the total depletion of plasma in a given domain. Okay. Okay, thank you, Bob. <clears throat> uh, I think we have uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. So uh, here there are a couple more, right? So this is a tremendous amount of work um, and many years. Um, let's see, I lost the question. Okay, this is a tremendous amount of work and many years of investment and development. Could you please uh, tell if and how our research community can access the model output? Yes, um, if you want to contact um, Lutke Shearless or Larry, you can get direct access for large data dumps. Don't forget, this is um, a lot of data. Okay, all right. So maybe we can follow up this with uh, by uh, the channel in Slack. Uh, I think, can we bring up the questions up a little bit more, please? So we already answered the difference between bubbles and irregularities. Um, there is, uh, I think, one more question that we can entertain, uh, Bob, from, uh, Osanjin Taiwood, thank you for the awesome presentation. If I may ask, what method of assimilation would you advise the users of empirical models to employ for better accuracy? Also, I want to ask the best data source to be considered for data assimilation. Well, GPS TEC data is the best because it's the most prevalent. Um, but for I, the ionosphere, NMF2 and HMF2 really are critical. Okay. All right. I guess we, we have two more questions. I think we might be able to answer this. Uh, um, thank you. So this is a truly impression amount of work on models and DA. Could you briefly highlight the reasons for having different models? Is this for ensemble forecast? Yes, if you have different models, you can then, they're all gonna come up with different results, no matter how good the individual data is similar to the model. Right, right. Uh, and, and then there is one final question. Are these data assembled simulation models running in real time? Yes, they are. Some of them are running in real time. And the game full physics, The gameful physics is running in real time at USU. Okay. In real time at USU and at the Air Force Weather Agency. Okay. Okay, Bob. Thank you very much. That was an amazing lecture. It was very, really inspirational too to see your hard work. We commend you for that. Thank you so much for giving this. Uh, talk today. So with that, uh, we thank you virtually. And we're going to move on to the next talk. Thank you. Bob. Thank you for so, having me. So our next talk is a memorial talk. And uh, it's going to be given by um, Professor Bella Feyer from Utah State University. And it's in remembering Stan Sazikin. Uh, Bella. It, it's an honor to pay homage to the life and career of Stanislav Sazikin. Stan left us suddenly and unexpectedly in May 4th at the age of 49. 
He was known to be a distinguished computational physicist. For all who know him, he was one of the smartest people they have ever met with a rigorous and penetrating mind. Stanislav was born in Kaliningrad, Russia. He earned a BS in physics and electrical engineering from the Moscow School of Physics and Technology in 1993 at the age of 21. The same year, he came to the US as an exchange student in the then USSR USA Bush Gorbachev exchange program and ended up in all places in Logan, Utah. In 1993, he started working in the physics department at Utah State University in rocket telemetry data. During 1993 and 1994, he was both a teaching and research assistant, and he earned a BS from Utah State in 1994 and started working my group in 1995. Since Stanislav had an engineering background as well, he first worked with Fred Biondi, John Merriweather and I in the empirical modeling of equatorial and low latitude thermospheric winds measured by Fabry-Perot interferometers. For that work, in which he used a novel local two-dimensional regression analysis based on articles he found in the Journal of Econometrics and the Journal of the American Statistical Association. He earned an MS from, uh, in 1996 from the Moscow Institute in Physics and, and Technology. And this degree was in space physics. As time went by at, at Utah, uh, he received a BS at Utah State University in 1995. It, 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 following uh, his uh, MS at the Moscow Institute of uh, Physics and, and, and Technology, he started working with me as a uh, teaching, uh, as a helping in my graduate math methods course, which he enjoyed very much. And then it became evident that he preferred to pursue uh, mostly theoretical space science studies. So it was decided that he should go to Rice University to do work with Dick Wolf on his theoretical space science studies. At Rice University, Stan reprogrammed the Rice convection model, a model of the Earth in a magnetosphere under the direction of Dick Wolf and, and Bob Spiral. He used, this uh, he used this model at Utah State University to study the effect of magnetospheric electric fields, which under disturbed conditions can penetrate all the way down to the equatorial ionosphere and cause significant perturbations on, on the plasma density and electrodynamics. He received his PhD from Utah State University in year 2000. And in the same year, he joined Rice University initially as a, as a postdoc and later rose in the ranks to research associate professor. At Rice, he continued the work on the rice convection model and was always the person everyone would go about learning in more detail about the rice convection model and its, and its uses. He also worked uh, in collaboration with several other researchers on the study of how the magnetosphere generates very strong electric fields just equatorward of the aurora zone, causing what is called, among other things, subaurora polarization, polarization streams. This work was done using coupled ionosphere magnetospheric models, one in collaboration with Naomi Maruyama 
and the other one with, with Joe Huba. At Rice, Stanislav also worked on the magnetosphere of Saturn and on interpretation of data from the magnetospheric multiscale mission. Lately, among other projects, Stanislav's working on the response of equatorial electric fields and um, plasma density on uh, two large geomagnetic storms using the rice convection model, large databases of radar and other ground-based measurements, GPS TC, and also plasma density measurements from the International Space Station. He was an active member of the scientific community. He served for years as a member of the steering committee of GEM, the Ge Geomagnetic Geospace Environmental Modeling Program, and offered shared focus groups and meetings with humor and penetrating comments. At Rice, he played an important role in the development of the university policies for both teaching and research faculty. Stanislav was also heavily involved in Houston in youth soccer. Stan had an impressive background. He was interested in everything. The folks at Rice tells me that he was even given advice of how to contest property tax assessments. He'll be sorely missed by his wife, Yang Yi, his three young children, and Andrew Logan and Victor, as well as by many members of the magnetospheric and ionospheric communities. His legacy, however, is going to live for a very, very long time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bella for that memorial in honor of our colleague, Stan Sosinski. I didn't get a chance to meet him. I'm really sorry to hear about this loss. He, he died very young. Uh, I would like to take a moment actually of silence in memory of him. Thank you. Uh, Bella, uh, are there any um, uh, initiatives from the family to establish a foundation or donation? No, well, it or has. The Rice University has, has done that, you know, and actually very, very well. I mean, his, uh, his colleagues at Rice, Dick Wolf, uh, was his, I should have mentioned Dick Wolf, Stanislav considered Dick Wolf his magnetospheric advisor, you know. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, um, we work closely with Dick Wolf and uh, Stanislav has been doing a, lately a lot of work uh, with me and his student Anastasia uh, on, on these storm, storm studies, which all came out from the initial interaction which all we had with Dick Wolf. Thank you so much for sharing this tribute to him, Bella. Uh, if there is any Thing we can do to help his memory, please let us know how we can link. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, let's transition into our next speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, Phil Chamberlain from the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado. And he's going to give a talk. Uh, the title of his talk is the flare irradiance spectrum model version two, uh, FISM or FISM2, an improved model of the sol solar spectral irradiance are ultraviolet wavelengths. And if you have questions, please uh, use Slido to ask your questions. So with that, Phil, you can take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julio. 
Um, yeah, so I'm thank you to the conveners for inviting me to come and give this talk on a on the newly released version of the flare irradiant spectral model um, or FISM2 as we're calling it. Um, it is a much improved model uh, over those. I see a lot of colleagues on the line that have actually used um, FISM, the original version. Um, and as Marty was pointing out yesterday, um, FISM was originally based on the C instrument on timed, um, which, which Marty was talking about the other Sabre, one of the other instruments on time, but is, time is now 20 years old. And we have a lot of new measurements that have come, come on board um, as well as longer duration um, measurements that have covered now 20 years of the solar UV um, irradiance. Uh, so it was about time to put out another, uh, an update to this model to, to provide a, a significant improvement on it. So thank you again for, for allowing me to talk and share some of these advancements and how you can utilize this model. So, um, so this is just a quick outline of what I'll be talking about. Um, once again, I'm just going to introduce solar UV spectral radiance. This has been talked about a lot throughout this conference already uh, as one of the primary drivers and energy inputs into the into the Earth, especially the ionosphere and thermosphere. Um, and I'm going to briefly present some of the measurements that we have made because in any empirical model, it's only as going to be as good as the measurements that make them. Um, and then, once again, this this community knows very well the the space weather effects. Um, Bob mentioned them some in his previous uh, talk that was a very good introduction. Um, some of the space weather effects that could be happening on all time scales um, of the ultraviolet radiance um, as a driver to dynamics in the ionosphere and thermosphere. Um, and then the crux of the talk is getting into FISM2. Um, what is FISM2? How does it fill the, fill the measurement gaps? And how accurately does it do that? Um, and then I'm going to show you Lizard, which is the one-stop shop for any solar irradiance uh, measurements uh, that that we have or models such as FISM. Um, and then what what does the future have for us? So so solar radiance. Um, so solar radiance is really cool. With my involvement uh, when I was at Goddard with SDO, you get SDO has an imager, an AI imager on board that produces these very beautiful images of the sun on the that you can see on the right. This one in the helium to uh, 30.4 nanometer uh, emission line. And so what solar radiance does though, is it takes all these beautiful fine features of the sun and just integrates over all of them. <laughs> so it's kind of sun is the star. Uh, and, and, but what we can do then is get really high spectral resolution as well as very large spectral range coverage um, to accurately quantify the amount of energy the sun is giving off and therefore the amount of energy that is an input into planetary ionosphere and thermosphere, as well as other things like, like lunar dust charging. Um, so you see some examples of the solar radiance and the many features um, from a paper we published for a solar minimum reference spectrum in 2009, um, spanning many wavelengths um, and a lot of orders of magnitude in the actual irradiance variability. Um, so, and zooming in on the ultraviolet wavelengths now, um, UV or ultraviolet wavelengths, we, we commonly break these down. Uh, there's an ISO standard um, right now uh, that breaks these down into sort of the soft X-ray ultraviolet or XUV from 0.1 to 10 nanometers, the extreme ultraviolet from 10 to 120 nanometers, and the far ultraviolet for one, from 121 to 200 nanometers. And what you see when you zoom in on this is you not only have the, you know, the, sh the short wavelength high energy end of the black body continuum, but it ends up being dominated once you get to the EUV, partially in the FUV, definitely in the UV, and, and even more so in the XUV, by very strong free-free uh, and free-bound uh, emission lines, as well as the bound-bound emission lines. Uh, and so you have sources in here that come from all different temperatures, all different regions in the solar atmosphere. And, then, and because of that, they just don't all behave the same way. Um, so when you get into sort of the empirical models that I do, you need lots of different proxies or lots of different specifications um, for all the different individual lines, um, including some of them. So the coronal lines, the ones that you see in green are, are mainly optically thin. There is some optical thickness uh, to these emission lines uh, and the soft x-rays as well. Um, but these, these chromospheric and transition region emission lines in the blue and red are optically thick. So they behave very differently um, when you look at solar rotation time scales as well as solar flares. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you need to take into account the optical thickness of these 
emission lines that are formed lower down in the solar atmosphere uh, where it's more dense. And then you take this and you look at the, uh, at the solar cycle and the solar rotation variability. So you look at time scales of, you know, sort of weeks on the solar rotation, you know, days to weeks, uh, solar rotation, how much this, this energy driver to the IT system can vary, um, as well as solar cycle. Uh, there's been a lot of people presenting, presenting on solar cycle, you know, multi-decade changes in the solar EUV irradiance driver. I mean, you look at the, and the amount of change, this very significant amount of change. Um, it's shown in absolute values. The black is the solar minimum reference spectrum. The red line is for a very strong solar rotation. And the blue line is for a very, is for over a solar cycle. And you see how much it can change. Um, you see the percent change is a function of wavelength in the lower right. Um, and you see it could change um, for solar rotation, solar cycles. Uh, you know, maybe it's only a 10% change in the FUV. There's some, some strong uh, transition region emission lines in there that could change by maybe a, a factor of two. But you look at down at the very short wavelengths, the very high energy photons, and these can change by many orders of magnitude. Um, and in these soft X-rays, um, factors of a thousand. Um, so it's so it's really important to accurately quantify this highly variable um, EUV, um, especially the XUV uh, wavelength ranges. And the XUV is one thing that has drastically improved from going from the FISM one model that was released um, 15 years ago to this new version of FISM two that is that was released in December. And uh, speaking to the CDR community, I think. You guys are the uh, you, you all are the experts on this. <laughs> I don't have to drill this in, uh, but that lower left shows shows a plot I really like um, from from Stan and Liang and in, in their papers showing where the energy is deposited as a function of wavelength uh, in the atmosphere. Um, it, it heats up the thermosphere, it creates the ionosphere, um, causing neutral density, um, electron density, neutral temperature changes uh, on similar time scales. Um, as a solar driver, as seen by this plot from Judith Lean. Um, and that in turn, um, even, even on terms of solar flares on, on seconds to minutes, uh, this is a strong solar flare in this, in this third plot um, by Eric Sutton that shows the Halloween storm um, in October of 2003, showing the large density change, um, neutral density change um, in, the, in the, once again, low latitude um, equatorial regions um, due to the high change in the energy input from solar flares. Um, that is a very sudden change. Um, and when you get density changes, you then look at, once again, when you talk about space weather, you really want to take it to how does this affect our technology? We've heard about radio um, blackouts that occur, but also satellite drag. There was a wonderful movie um, yesterday afternoon in one of the breakout sessions from a colleague at MIT that shows with these super, super constellations that are becoming more prominent and lots of satellites going up there and, and with CubeSats going up there, it, it's getting really, really overly populated up there um, in space. And so conjunction analysis and accurate, accurately be able, being able to predict the density at any given altitude that will drive into, that will lead into satellite drag um, is going to be very important going in, into the future. Um, and, and in order to do that, you need to be able to specify the solar radiance, solar UV radiance changes uh, real time and uh, on the, at the frequency of seconds to minutes. Um, you can't rely on a daily value um, if you want to do this, as you can see from the density changes due to the flare um, from Eric. So, and because all this energy is absorbed in the atmosphere, um, you can't observe it from the ground. You have to go up into space um, to be able to observe it. So you see a, a large suite of, of instruments that we have used um, over the past a decade to two decades um, in order to quantify, to accurately quantify the changes and the absolute irradiance of, of solar radiance over all time scales from minutes, seconds to minutes uh, due to solar flares, from days to weeks due to the solar rotation, sort of the, the lighthouse of beacon effect um, as the active region moves across the solar disk and then over solar cycles. And that's another great improvement of FISM too, is now we, we now have 20, measure, 20 years of measurements of accurately quantifying the solar irradiance. So now we have a solar cycle and a half um, to, to more accurately quantify um, and predict the solar EUV irradiance on solar cycle time scales. Um, and now getting into FISM two, 
Um, FISM2, the flare rate and spectrum model version two is now available. Um, and I'm only gonna briefly touch on some of the algorithms and some of the empirical modeling and some of the corrections that we do. Um, but you see in that blue box there is highlighted, there's a publication that, that is now out that you could go in and find all the nitty gritty details of the model. Um, a lot better job than I'm gonna touch on here on the uncertainty um, calculation. Uh, and so, and always please feel free to email me if you wanna discuss this, if you wanna work on how to implement FISM2 um, into, uh, into your IET model, uh, data simulation model, anything you want, um, please reach out to me. I'm very happy to help, um, help you get going on this and get this integrated. Um, but as I said, the biggest improvement is the new measurement data set it's based on. Uh, these first four bullets are new measurements that cover a broad spectral range with sufficient spectral resolution of up to one angstrom spectral resolution and, and really good accuracy as well as temporal cadence um, in order to quantify the variability due to solar flares and the space weather impact that those have. The bottom two are new proxies uh, that are available, um, especially and one I'm really excited about is the, the new GOES EUVS measurements that were, have now been publicly released as of a month ago. And this provides really good proxies of, as I was mentioning, the, the chromospheric and transition region emissions, these cooler emissions from the solar atmosphere um, that we haven't had previously on a high cadence. Uh, we've only had the soft X-ray measurements from XRS for the flare proxy, but now we have these really cool EUVS measurements that really show the impulsive phase of a solar flare. You see there's two sort of different phases on solar flares, the impulsive phase and the gradual phase. Um, and so right now we're going to hopefully be able to quantify the, the change due to this very quick, very first stage of the impulsive phase of a flare much better than we have before um, due, to, due to these ex, excess measurements. Um, and as I mentioned, all measurements are now one angstrom or better, which allows FISM2 to now be improved uh, from its one nanometer bins that FISM1 was at to one angstrom bins. Uh, that, that really helps with the energy partition with the, with the, with, with the highly dynamic uh, photoionization cross sections um, and feeding them in to really get that energy partition correct. Um, and we've observed a lot more flares. SDOE has observed well over a thousand flares and source solstice has observed hundreds of flares um, at different times at different wavelengths due to its instrument. Um, and that's so much better than the uh, FISM-1 was based on 26 flares that happened to be observed by time C. So there's, there's a much better data set to train the empirical model on, much more accurate, much more, a lot more events and spanning a lot larger time scale, as I said, you know, now, you know, 10 years or 15 years. Um, so this is kind of a quick example. Once again, please see all the details and all the, there's a lot more examples, look at many different emission lines, different emission scales in, in the space weather paper. Um, but this is just kind of an example. You see in the middle, the, the, the solar cycle. Um, Marty mentioned this, this yesterday. Many folks have mentioned mentioned this, uh, Bob mentioned it earlier today, the, the 11 year solar cycle on how the change in the UV irradiance happens. And basically with an empirical model, you just wanna train your larger data sets that cover full, a larger spectral range and train them to a set of proxies. Proxies are a subset, you know, a handful of measurements that quantify the variability um, that you're trying to estimate, um, but they're, they're, they have much better temporal coverage. Uh, both higher cadence as well as, you know, uh, over their, their temporal range over decades, um, if not multiple decades in terms of XRS and Lyman Alpha and Magnesium 2 are some of the some of the examples. But you just basically train it. They could be linear or power law um, relationships between the proxy, which is on the x-axis, and the actual measurement um, you're trying to model on the y-axis. So in this case, on the left, we're trying to do a solar cycle uh, empirical model between the 17.1 the nanometer proxy to the helium-2304 uh, measurement. And this is the solar cycle. So I've smoothed over 108 days to eliminate all the solar rotation variability um, and any solar flares that may be there, their daily average measurements. Uh, and so you see a really good sort of linear relationship between 304 and 171. And therefore, anytime now that we have the 171 measurement, we can now make an empirical model estimation of what the helium-2304 solar cycle uh, variation may be. And then on the bottom, on the bottom right, you see the same proxy and measurement, but this time I've subtracted off this 108-day smooth from the daily 
um, the, the daily average measurement and you get the residuals. So you get the solar rotation beating, as I said, this is, this is the sort of days to, days to week variability. That's the residual that's left over. So it once again will vary around zero. Uh, and you see that now anytime helium two, three or four isn't available, we can now use this relationship to the 17.1 nanometer proxy um, to, to estimate the variability that is occurring. So this is just a simple linear relationship. Um, and what you can see there then in the lower left is you see the actual measurements that were made SD, from SDO Eve. This is the version seven data product that's soon to be released in blue, but we lost SDO Eve, uh, Meg's A channel um, in mid 2014. So we no longer have that measurement of the, of the helium 2304 from, from SDO Eve. But due to the relationships I just showed on the previous slide, we can now use a proxy such as the 171 uh, or 17.1 nanometer emission line uh, to extend this out. And you, so you see the FISM2 models there, model there in black because we still have 17.1 nanometer proxy over this time period. We're able to estimate what the measurement would have been would we have it. And I do wanna point out that I also put in this relationship using F10.7 as, as a proxy. And you see, it does not do a good job at solar minimum. You're off by you know, about 10% at solar minimum because F10.7 is not a good proxy during solar minimum time. And it's not a good proxy for solar rotation in general. Um, so for those of you out there that still use F10.7 to drive Hey, Dr. Model, Chamberlain? Yes. Uh, this is your two minute warning. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, and then, so we see other, other wavelengths over there where FISM fills in the gap. And then when you get into solar flares, you have a lot of physics of solar flares between the impulsive phase in red and the black is the thermal gradual phase. Um, and, and you have to model both of those as well. And so these are power laws. And so you use the GOES XRS for the gradual phase and the time derivative of the GOES XRS for the impulsive phase. Like I said, I want Xs now. I have to incorporate these new cool measurements from Xs, but I haven't done that yet. That's gonna be FISM3. And you get these great power law relationships. What you see for optically thick emissions is that the, that flares in the center of the disk are don't behave um, the same as flares on the limb of the disk when you use an optically thin proxy to model an optically thick emission line. So you have to also account for this center to limb variability of solar flares. Um, once again, all the details are in the paper or please let me know. And then you're able to then simulate flares. You see the the black line are SDO Eve measurements, and the red line are the FISM2 measurements of solar flares, as well as the breaking it down into impulsive phase green and the gradual phase purple components if you want to do that. But red is really the, the final product. Um, and then you get the uncertainties, um, the increase during solar flares. And you see a lot of variability. I already showed this slide showing the amount of variability, the percent change by orders of magnitude um, in some of these wavelengths during solar flares. And so once again, we realize there's lots of data sets out there and models. Um, so we have this lizard data set, data site set up. There's a one-stop shop that you could get all those measurements that I showed in the previous slide, uh, time C, SEO Eve, source solstice, minx, but you can also get FISM and you just type in FISM2 into the search bar and you come up with data products. And I do wanna mention that I already have a data product that's being served here that is already binned into the stan bands. Um, and is at five minute cadence um, that hopefully will eliminate a step if you wanna integrate FISM2 into, into your models such as Wacom, Wacom X or Time GCM. And I know I have, a, I know I have a, a task right now that I'm trying to get the, in, and provide it in the EUVAC bins. Um, so, so just in conclusion, there's large data set out there of measurements, um, but there's still gaps in those. And if you wanna fill those gaps and you wanna do, do provide accurate solar EUV irradiance inputs into your model uh, to fill these gaps, FISM2 is where to go. Um, and F10.7 is, is not sufficient, especially on solar rotations time scales, and especially during solar minimum um, times. Uh, I, I just I want to keep stressing F10.7, we, we should move beyond F10.7 as a community. Um, and in the bottom left, there's a lot of future instruments that are coming along that will open help improve the measurement accuracy on lots of time scales and a lot of these wavelengths, especially in the soft X-ray uh, that we want to take advantage of. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Phil, for that great talk. That was that was really great. Uh, so you, I, I, we're running out of time in the, uh, but maybe we have a, we can have some questions from Slido. I, I have one question actually. So you say F ten point seven is not sufficient. We've been using that for a long time. Yep. <laughs> so what would be the change? What would be the new version of that? So. so what, uh, so one thing I'll present, I, I added in the FISM2 slides tomorrow for a modeling session. Um, but one thing we can do, I mean, the best thing to do is use a full spectral radiance model into the cross sections, into, into the full physics. But one thing you can also do is just sum up zero to 100 nanometers or zero to 190 nanometers and use that as an as a in-place in proxy or QEV, zero to 50 nanometers. Um, and, and Lisa and Cole, who have just published a paper, um, have proven that just you doing that provides a much better proxy for an empirical TEC model uh, that they have just published that I encourage you to go look. And it's in, in slides in a, in a breakout session tomorrow that I provide some, some examples of that. But that's a simple thing to do is just integrate from zero to 50. Okay, thank that you. Works. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, can we bring the, uh, maybe a question from Slido? Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, great work, Phil. What is the latency of FISM2 and providing the beam values for EU VAC? Yeah, so unfortunately, the latency is about six days right now. Um, oh, because okay. <laughs> it's a huge, I, I would love, and, and I hate answering this question. It's a great question. I hate answering it, um, but it's unfortunately a, a, a funding and an effort pro issue. <laughs> I would love <laughs> to get the fun. It's a lot of effort to provide, as many on here know, to provide a real time redundant or accurate space weather model that, that runs in real time. It can be done. It can be done for forecasting. I would love to do that. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to secure the funding. Um, per personally, it's been, I've written some, I need to be better writing more compelling proposals. Um, uh, right. But I hope, I hope to in the future to provide a real time as well as a forecast version of FISM. I have plenty of ideas how to do it, just not the time to do it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Phil, I think we don't have uh, time to answer. You know, there are two more questions on Slido. We can pass them for uh, CDAR Slack so we can follow up maybe with your answers from that channel. Most definitely. I uh, want, want to thank you. This, this was a really great talk, fantastic. Uh, thank you. I want to thank, sure. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers and I also want to give my apologies for my technical problems at the beginning of the session. Uh, things happen, you know, sometimes. I want to remind everyone, please, that uh, to check the Zoom links have been updated in the main CEDAR website. So please check the Zoom links for the workshops or the many workshops. Uh, we have a break now, um, supposed to have a 10 minute break, but running half of the time to that. So uh, please uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the meetings, the rest of the workshop you want to participate. Uh, and with that, I will stop the plenary session. Thank you so much.